Okay, so thanks so, for coming back. <laughs> for, I do want to point out that, you know, I introduced Cynthia at the beginning, but she's truly remarkable because she has a PhD in math, applied in computational math. She's also well recognized in statistics. I don't know, have high awards there. And she's a professor in computer science and other places as well. So it's very few people, there are very few people that bring, can bring together all these things. And, and she has done real applications. So we are so lucky to be learning. Thank you. And, and, you know, to be honest, it's intimidating with the senior people here who are quite established as well. But I'll, I'll, I'll pretend I don't have a pasta syndrome. That's okay. Okay. So, um, so what we were talking about last time, uh, we started with classification error. We were our predictions are the sign of f of x, and then f of x is a linear combination of these step functions. Okay. Um, and so then we changed our you know, notation for classification error, we found out that this was equal to this because y times f, the sign of that, uh, you know, tells us the information that we need uh, for this one. Okay, so they're the same. Uh, and then, um, okay, so then what we did was we took this function of the margin, which is y times f. Okay, okay. again, y times f being positive means correct classification, y times f negative means misclassification, and then this function is Gesundheit squared. Um, this function is um, um, one if you're misclassified and zero if you're correctly classified. That is not smooth. You can't minimize it so easily. I mean, you can with, you know, we did it with decision trees, but it's, it's kind of hard to minimize. So what we did was we upper bounded that by an exponential loss, okay, like this, e to the negative y times that. All right, so this exponential loss is the loss that's used in boosting. Uh, it's, you know, one of the most popular loss functions in machine learning, and I happen to love this loss function. I, I use this all the time for everything, and there's a, there's a bunch of reasons why I love this loss function. Okay, and I was in the middle of telling you why I love this loss function, and the reasons are that it is convex in the parameters of f. Uh, it also has an analytical solution for the minimizer, which I'm not going to cover because it requires a massive ton of notation, pages and pages. Uh, it's, it's, it's funny. It's like an if blah, 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 then use alpha equal this formula. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, there's also a nat natural conversion to probabilities, and I'm going to derive that conversion. Um, today, right now, <laughs> soon, actually, first I'm going to do, I'm going to prove that it's convex, and then I'm going to prove there's a conversion to the probabilities. Okay, and then I pointed out that the problem that we actually want to solve looks kind of like this. So we want to minimize the exponential loss over all functions of f. We want the model to be sparse, meaning there's only a small number of step functions um, in the model. Uh, and um, that requires a best subset search uh, problem which we can do now that we have computers that are millions of times faster than they were 20 years ago or whatever. Okay, so I want to prove these principles of the exponential loss so that you too will fall in love with the exponential loss. Okay, so my first thing that I have to prove is the, that the exponential loss is convex. So I will try to convince you of that. Okay. So why would this thing be convex? Okay, so I'll just write it up again here so that you can see it. And all of you, you know, uh, mathematicians, maybe will think this is obvious, but it took me a while to kind of get used to computing with um, exponent with convex functions. So it's convex in alpha. Okay, and I just put that vector notation up, up in the top there. I guess x is a vector too, so I can do that. Okay, so why is this true? Well, so can you remind me what alpha is again? Because it's not y and x. Sorry. Okay, so. Oh, I see. It's a description of f. It's yes, so f is parameterized by alpha. Right. The coefficients of the linear model. And, and right, this is what we're optimizing. 
this is what we're optimizing. And this L, this L0 term is on the alphas. Right. Yeah. We're optimizing. Uh, alphas are the weights, right? Yeah. And the H, H yeah. days are just height functions of height one. Or something. Yes. Yeah. These yeah. are functions yeah. like one if age is greater than 30. Right. Right. Are you optimizing the, the, where the steps are in the function? Yes. So you have a massive pile of these H days. Right. For all different age, for all different ages, all different right. variables. But you have a lot of choices, so you're not you're optimizing that too. Well, you're optimizing which alphas are non-zero mm -hmm. and what the values of those alphas are. Right. And that determines which steps you're going to use mm -hmm. in your model. And all the other steps just go away. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Everybody good? Okay, great. All right. So this L0 term is just the number of non-zero alphas. Okay. So anyway, I'm not working with this right now. I'm just working with this guy, okay? And I wanna prove that this is convex in alpha. Okay, and of course you guys are gonna be like, oh yeah, it's obvious, but no. It's not, not obvious to people who don't work with convex functions all the time. Okay. So the first thing, whoops, the first thing I wanna point out is that F alpha of Xi is linear in alpha. So that means it's both convex and concave. Okay. Why does this keep going to erase it? Not today. It is alpha transpose times xi, right? So f is convex in alpha. Okay. So that's the first thing you need to know is that f itself is convex in alpha. Okay, so we also know that y times f is convex, is, well, it's, it's also linear. So it's also, you know, that. So it's also con both concave and convex. So, um, so y times f, y times f of alpha, alpha, f alpha of xi is also convex in alpha, okay? We just multiply the line by a constant, so that didn't change its convexity, right? This is a line that is both convex and concave, and so that's trivial. Another thing you need to know is that e to the negative z, whatever z is, is convex in z, okay? So what does convex mean? So convex, it, there's, there's a, you know, there's a, an official definition, but the official definition is the same as the intuitive definition, which is that no matter, you know, you have two friends and they're standing on this function. And if they can see each other without interruptions, no matter where they stand, then the function is convex, okay? So a function like this is not convex because the two friends can stand here and here and they would not be able to see each other through this bump in the function, okay? So e to the negative z, um, I don't even need to prove it to you. You can just believe that this is a convex function, all right? Because these two friends, no matter where they stand, they can always see each other um, without interruption. Okay. Now, another thing you need to know is that a convex function of a convex function is convex. So what that means is that e to the negative yi f alpha of xi is convex. Okay, we're almost there. The last thing you need to know is that a sum of convex functions is convex. And once you have that, we are done. And if you can remember all of these rules, it makes your life a lot easier when somebody plops a function up there on the screen. You can go, oh yeah, I know how to minimize that thing. That's convex. <laughs> and over i, e to the negative y i, f alpha of x i is convex. Great. And then why do I say it's easy to minimize? And it's because for convex functions, f 
every local minima, minimum is a global minimum. So all you have to do essentially is slide down this function and you will get to something that globally minimizes it because it's convex. Okay, cool. So I'll give you a second to, to kind of just check that over. I, I can make these this document available, right? I can yes. okay. yeah. please do. Okay. So the next thing I want, so this one's done. Uh, the next thing I want to do is prove that there's a natural conversion from the exponential loss to probabilities. Uh, anybody have a favorite color? Let's do this dark pink. Okay, let's do this one. All right. So I'll write here uh, X plus has a probabilistic interpretation. Let's do that one. Okay, so what I want you to do here is I want you to think of y as a random variable given x. So I give you x, I want you to think of y as being a random variable and its distribution, you know, there's a probability that it equals one. Uh, and there's a probability that it equals minus one, right? It can only take <laughs> two values. We're doing binary classification. Okay, so these are the two values it can take on <laughs> one and minus one, and the sum of the two probabilities is one. Okay, so I want you to think of y as a random variable. So if, you, if I give you x, then um, there's some probability that y is one and some probability that y is minus one. So I'm going to write down a theorem. Uh, this is a theorem, I believe it's uh, in, well, it's at least in the book of Hasty uh, Friedman and Tip Sharani. Okay. And the theorem says that uh, the expectation of y given x of e to the negative y times f of x is minimized at f of x equals one half log probability y equals one given x over the probability that y equals minus one given x. Okay. So what that does, what that does is it at least gets you from, it at least gets you from the exponential loss to some probabilities, okay? So uh, neither of those can, probabilities can be zero. Uh, so the probabilities are not, are not zero. So let's assume that they're not zero, okay? okay. They're not zero. Because it, it would be quite bad in machine learning if we said, that the probability is it of, okay, so this could be quite bad if we predicted that the probability that y equals one equals zero, because what you, you could actually get, you know, you could actually get a new data point at that x that, that has that y right, value. So, right. you, so you always want to keep them all positive. You always want to keep them all positive because okay. otherwise you're, you could predict things that are not true, right. which is often why we use regularization and okay. things like logistic right. regression to right. prevent those probabilities from saturating. Right. Okay. Okay. So, um, so this this at least gets us from the exponential loss to some sort of probabilistic model. Um, but I I'll keep going after this, and we'll figure out how to get. What we really want is to get from f to this probability, and that we can that we're going to do. Okay. So, but I at least want to prove the theorem first. Okay. It's very it's a very simple theorem. Okay. So the proof here goes like this. So we take the expectation of e to the negative y times f. So this is just, I'm using the definition of expectation here. 
Now, the reason I'm doing e to the negative f there is because y equals 1. So this is supposed to be e to the negative y times f, but y is 1. And so I've just not written it there. Okay. And then this is plus probability y equals minus 1 given x e to the f. And again, y equals minus one here. So the y and the minus sign cancel right there. All right. Good. So um, we're here. And then if I take the derivative of this, z so equals zero. What I get is minus probability y equals one given x plus okay, so then I'm just going to put this thing on the other side and I get here. And then I'm getting closer. So <coughs> I'm going to put the, I'm going to just rearrange the terms here. Okay. And so now I've got it. So f of x equals one half log, and then the same fraction. And I believe I've now proven the theorem. Yes. I'll make a little box. So. Okay, great. So now that I've proven this theorem, I can rearrange this expression here to solve for the probability that y equals 1 given, given x. I'm going to solve that in terms of f. And that is going to get us from f to those probabilities and not the other way around. Okay, so all right, we're going to rearrange. And so I end up with, let's see here. So let's write this down in a nicer way. Um, I'm going to call this um, P on the top, and I'll call this 1 minus P in the bottom, just to make my life easier in terms of notation. Or this P is just the probability that Y equals 1 given X. OK? So then um, what I can do is I'll take, um, uh, so I'll take here. Um, e to the 2 f of x uh, equals p over 1 minus p. So I just undid the, the 1 half and the log and put them back. Okay. And then here I have e to the 2 f of x times 1 minus p times e to the 2 f of x equals p. Okay. And so what I'm left with here is e to the 2 f of x equals p times 1 plus e to the 2 f of x. And then I have here p equals, and then I'll just write its definition back in there so that we have it, e to the 2 f of x, oops, 1 plus e to the 2 f of x. And that is what I wanted. So this is my nice expression, and I'm very happy that I now have. Great. So this thing, what it does is it converts the value of the predictions into the probabilities that y equals 1 given x. So you get these, you know, your predictions are real values. They're like any number between negative infinity to infinity, right? They could be any number. It's just, you know, alpha times x. And so you plug it into this formula here, and you get a probability. You get a number between 0 and 1. Um, and if you actually plot this function, it's actually a function that looks just like this. It's like it's, it's very similar to, like, you know, um, write that down. 
Uh, why am I not, you know, with my artistic skills, I'm not that great. I, uh, I make up for that by using lots of colors. Okay. Okay, so what this means, um, now that we have this formula, here, I'm going to grab this formula, whoops, and bring it to the next page here because I'm running out of space. Okay, so what that means is that after solving for F, so after you've minimized the exponential loss, then you can plug it in, you, you can plug it in here to get risks. These risk estimates, which is what we what we want. We want to create a risk score. So and we want to know the probability that someone has a stroke. Um, and so we can get their score, which is you know, add up a bunch of steps like based on their age and their blood pressure and so and so. Then you have their score and you plug it into that formula and you can get an estimate for their risk of having a um, um, stroke in the future. Okay, so here again, just to remind you, f of x is the sum of these step functions. This one is age, and this one maybe is blood pressure, uh, and whatever other step functions you have. Um, this. So. so, so initially, so the way you know the places you put the steps, how much does that influence this? Okay, so it doesn't influence it at all. <laughs> so regardless of what model you construct, you can always use this formula to try to convert to risks. Right. You know, it's some but if, I put, but if I put the steps in a different place, I'll get a different. Yeah, you might get a different risk. Yeah, that's right. And sometimes, sometimes the risks are not that accurate. So you often want to kind of recalibrate it with your data. So you might want to plot like predicted risk versus true risk. And if you calculate the true risks, you have to you have to kind of bin groups of people uh, with similar scores, and then you estimate the risks based on people with similar scores, and then you can recalibrate if this is not if this is not. But it also <laughs> might be good to, to use as many steps as you can in your step function because it just filters them out and everything. Not necessarily. Uh, but it, it, it's the more steps you use, the more likely you are to overfit your data. Okay. So you generally want to use kind of like not that many steps. And then also, if you want doctors to be able to memorize the model and understand it, you probably don't want to use too many steps. Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a rule of thumb for when we take scores and then uh, take them to probabilities in terms of like interpretability? Like say, if we give our class a predictive model to someone for practice and then we say these are like numbers between zero and one, but then uh, how do they link to like probabilities like in the set test? Thing? Yeah, so so this is a, a good question. So you're, you're asking about communication with doctors. So it, it it depends. So if you so if you are using a regular just like a GAN function, what you can do is um, you can provide. So okay, let's go from the most complex to the least complex. Okay, so the most complex thing you can do is you could um, provide the doctor with a bunch of these step functions. So here's this, let's say this is the um, component function for age. And here's the component function for blood pressure. If you have blood pressure more than blah, blah, blah. And if you have, you know, and, and you have like how many points you get, maybe um, 0.7, right? So you, you're gathering up some number of points for based on these, based on these, things and then you have a total number of points so let's say this person has this age that blood pressure and this whatever it is okay so you get the total number of points you know 57.3 and then there's a conversion table that converts you to uh to the uh risks so here's your conversion table right there um and here i've done a conversion plot but this is your score. Ooh, did it again. This is your score, and here's your 57.3, and this is your risk. 
This is the probability you'll get a stroke given your features. So you can just provide this conversion table and you can just look up what the risk is. Okay, so that's the most complex version. The least complex version is if you create a scoring system where your step functions are not only forced to be steps, but they're forced to have integer coefficients. Okay, so then what you have is like you have a table that says if you have, um, if your age is greater than, uh, if, or if your age is between uh, age less than 40, with this many points, age between 40 and something else, age uh, 60, then you have, maybe this is like more, uh, zero points, and this is like three points, and then uh, five points if you're older, and so on, okay? And you have points for blood pressure, and okay? you have a total number of points, so you have like nine points or whatever your total is. Um, and then you have an actual conversion table. So it's like, okay, this is the number of points and this is your risk estimate. This is called a risk score, by the way, when you have, in, when everything is integers. So the points are like, you know, um, three, four, five, up to whatever. And your risk is like 20%, <laughs> 30% and whatever. And so the doctors can just look up the numbers in the table without having to look at any plots. Is there an optimal way to convert to uh, construct a scoring system there? Yeah, so you, here you have to add integer coefficients on all of the alphas. Right, okay. Um, and then the problem becomes harder. It becomes a mixed integer nonlinear program. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, I, uh, there are papers on how to do this. I know the full literature on this topic. But it, it goes a little bit beyond where I want to go, but I'm happy to, happy to talk to you about that because it's a topic I love very, very dearly. Okay. Because I, I really do want doctors to use these, right. you know, these models. And right. so being able to solve optimization problems like that is really important. Okay. Um, and the two helps to be score that I showed the other day does solve this optimization problem using a mixture of cutting planes and branch and bound techniques. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A risk assessment curve that you have. This looks like a logistic equation. It does. So the only the difference is a factor of two. Sure. So if you're doing logistic regression, the equation's the same except that twos are actually ones. That's right. That's another reason why I love the exponential loss. It has all the properties of the logistic loss, except that the um, if you're using step functions. You have an analytical solution for the minimizer, so it makes it easier to work with. Yeah, yeah. Do you have um, error bounds for like these probability estimates depending on sample size? There are uh, there are error bounds. They're not that easy to construct, unfortunately. Even for logistic regression, there's not really a great way to construct such bounds. Um, one way to do it is using bootstrapping, where you take some of the data out. And and you know, uh, do it that way. But um, it's this is a topic that uh, it, it's important, and uh, I'm not. I, I don't have time to get into it today. But I, I do think it's very important to have these. But um, to be honest, when you're working with 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 this, with doctors, it's better just to present them with a risk table that looks kind of like that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, because otherwise you're giving them way too much information. You're like, well, the risk could range between 30 and 50 percent. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, it gets it gets a little too confusing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. So um, great. So the algorithm that I've been talking about. So I'm just going to show you here where we were. Right. So this, this problem where you want to minimize the exponential loss with the L0 norm, the algorithm that, um, that I've been telling you about is called fast sparse. And I'm going to write down kind of a, just a very quick pseudo code for fast sparse so that you kind of understand a little bit more what it does. And fast sparse is a 20, 2022 algorithm, I believe. So we're right up to the, right up to the most modern. I should know when it was published. Okay. All right. So this is, um, I'm going to call it fast sparse. But I'm also going to point out that this is almost the same thing as boosted stumps, which is an older algorithm. 
from the mid 90s. Okay, the only difference is the L0 terms. Boosted stumps doesn't have an L0. Boosted stumps doesn't do sparsity. Um, F first is, is the one that does the sparsity. Okay, so for T equals until they're converged. So converged means the loss is not going down very much at each iteration. Um, so you pick an HJ. So you pick one of these functions, these step functions. So one if age is less than 30 or something like that, like this. So here's age, this is 30. Okay, that's the function. And the way that that choice is made is using what's called a priority queue. So there's a way of arranging all of these HJs so that you're more likely to get um, one that will end up in the model. Okay, so um, so there's a, in other words, what I'm saying is there's a lot of complexity in this algorithm that I'm not talking about. And there's a, a function that ranks all of the HJs and um, you're gonna show the algorithm the HJs in that order. Okay, and then what you do is you optimize your coefficient alpha j. Okay, and then the way you do that is you do argmin over alpha j, sum over i, e to the negative yi times f alpha of xi plus alpha j, this is your special j, hj of xi. So in other words, you're going to make an update by adding one more term or updating one of the terms already in there by changing the, the, um, the step for that hj, okay? So you make that update. And, and as I mentioned earlier, this calculation is actually an analytical calculation. It's a formula. It's not you know, gradient descent. It's, it's actually just a formula that plops you from here to here. <laughs> so it tells you what the alpha j is. And then, so I'll write here analytical formula. And this, this only works when the HJs are step functions. It doesn't work when the HJs are anything else. Okay, now, uh, this, um, uh, this thing we'll call it alpha J star. And if alpha J star is sufficiently close to zero, Um, you're going to set it equal to zero. And there's a formula that's another analytical formula that tells you when to do this. The formula that says if alpha j star is less than blah, 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 set it equal to zero. And then n4. Okay. So this, this um, algorithm just, it sweeps through all, this is how it's doing the best subset search. It's sweeping through all the j's using this priority queue. Sweeping through all of them and figuring out whether or not it can add um, that HJ to the bottle. Um, if it can't, it'll just set the it'll just set the coefficient to zero and move on to the next one. Okay, and then from there, once you have your, you know, once you because you're doing this really fast, you're doing it over and over and over again. So it's got every computation here has to be fast because otherwise you're not going to solve this NP-hard problem of figuring out which coefficients to keep in your model. And then once you've done that, you use the um, equation here, this equation, this risk calculation there, this guy, you use this guy to convert f of x to probabilities. And then you can go ahead and use it to make risk predictions. Okay. So hopefully that gives you a sense of the, the algorithm and what it does. So you can see here that every, you know, like I said, every computation needs to be fast, right? This priority queue has to be good so that you're 
you know, you're specifically looking at, at terms that might get added to the model. And all of these, this is all analytical. So it has to be fast, right? It's going to be fast because it's just a formula. And you just over and over and over again, you do it very, very quickly. And then once you're done, you have your steps and then you convert them to probabilities using the formula. So can you, uh, I was listening to a, a seminar on survival analysis so we've been applying it in, in the medical setting over and over again. Can't you use this technique to do survey you know, the survival curves and everything and to, uh, and to uh, attribute it to certain, attribute the survival predictions to certain, you know, certain uh, features? This is what's next on our research agenda. Okay. We have it on our list. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Okay, good. So that's a, a great question. Unfortunately, I, we haven't done it yet. <laughs> so. Well, that's very good to know. <laughs> yeah. So, you've, so I've gotten you up to up to the up to the present, and then you've gotten us to the future. <laughs> so that's, that's good. All right. So I want to. Um, I want to show you. Um, the other day, I mentioned that there was this data set. There's this data set from the um, FICO Explainable Machine Learning Challenge. I, do you remember I mentioned this data set? Where are all of you guys? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this data set was, was put out there as a benchmark data set. So in other words, the organizers of this competition, this was a bunch of people from Cornell and you know, really you know, good places. They put out this data set from FICO and they told everybody to create a black box and explain it. And the reason they did that was because they didn't know that it was possible to create interpretable models. From this, um, from this data set. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is um, the two techniques that we talked about. I'm going to tell you about the optimal decision tree method and the um, um, the fast sparse method for generalized additive models on this data set. And I'm going to show you what what they can do. And remember, this data set came out before those algorithms came out. So this is sort of um, sort of now, those algorithms could not have been used for this competition because they did not exist, but now they exist. Right? So I want to remind you what the deal is with this data set. 10,000 loan applicants, all kinds of information about their credit history. If you run a lot of machine learning methods on this data set, you'll get the best black box performance here at 73%. So I want to keep this number in mind, 73%, okay? Um, and then... I, as I told you before, if we, did the, if we did this thing where we had decomposable models, we didn't lose any performance. But this is not a sparse model. We were not aiming for sparsity here. We were aiming for something that looked like a neural network. <laughs> so, um, so then, um, the, so we had a bunch of sparse generalized additive models sort of, you know, that were, the, the thing had, the whole thing had, were, was decomposed into these smaller generalized additive models that used you know, one to four factors each. Um, but now we're going to try and create a global model that is um, global model that is sparse. And we'll, we're going to try and see how sparse we can go and still maintain performance. Okay, so if you take each of these variables and you convert them to these dummy, these, you know, these step functions like um, number of inquiries in the last six months greater than one, greater than two, greater than three, greater than four, greater than five, like you convert to all these possible dummy variables and you use every possible dummy variable you can possibly create out of the data set, you get 19, 17 binary features. So our feature space is this big and a lot of our features are very, very heavily correlated because they're step functions that are very close to each other, right? So in other words, Number of inquiries in the last six months, and excluding seven days, that could be greater than one, that could be greater than two. Right. Those two features are correlated with each other. So there's lots of highly correlated features here. Okay, so fast virus finishes in under 20 seconds. And its training and uh, test accuracy are right around the best, which is 73%. Its train and test AUC are also right about right about the same as the best of the black boxes. So we don't sacrifice performance over the black boxes. 
And what I'm going to show you on the next slide is one of the, one of the fast sparse models. It's a model with 21 binary features. Um, and this is the model. Okay, that's that's the whole model. Uh, and you can, you know, you, the whole thing fits on a slide. Uh, there's only 21 steps total in this thing. And you can you can kind of interpret it. So for instance, you can look at months since oldest trade opened. So if the person opened their opened their uh, um, oldest trade, like their, you know, all their accounts are within a hundred months, right? If they're recent, they get a lot more risk points because they're, you know, they're they're a recent trader, they're risky. And if they're, let's say their number of satisfactory trades is really low, like they've had very few satisfactory trades, they get uh, higher risk points. Um, and um, the external risk estimate, this one seems to be kind of a, a really, a very useful feature. And it's very sensitive between values 60 to 80 and not sensitive outside that range. And so this um, additive model can capture exactly that type of behavior because those steps can be anywhere. Okay, so um, the nice thing about this model, it was created in under four seconds. And this is the typical amount of time it takes to create a model like this from this data set. Okay, so that's the power of the uh, method that I taught you today is, is that you can do this kind of stuff very, very quickly. And it's a model that you can fit on a slide and explain it to people. Okay, and you know, I really want to point out that you cannot get to this level of interpretability if you're taking a black box and explaining it. Because the, usually those explanations are like, oh, which variables are important? <laughs> It's like, I know exactly which variables are important <laughs> in my prediction, because I know how many points I get for each of the variables. I know exactly what happens here. So, so you developed a scoring system with this as well? No, we haven't developed a scoring system with this data set yet. Yeah, we're still working on the scoring system. Yeah, this is all, everything here is just real value. Making a scoring system is much harder. Because okay. yeah, when you have the integer constraints, then it forces everything to be, you know, the feasible region is the integer lattice, and it's just a big. So it's very difficult, difficult to make it fast. It's very difficult to make it fast. Yeah. This one, this one, I mean, to get these models so sparse from such big data sets so quickly is, you know, we're we're happy enough to get to sort of this point here. Yeah, but we're very. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So then. Um, I want to go back and show you the results. Oh, sorry, was there a question? Yeah. So I right back to the last slide. Yep. I was wondering if like I I was curious like what happened uh between 20 and 40, but the trend is just then the information it just uh, doesn't tell us that I'm sorry, which which like, feature? For example, for the first graph, if I was like, I oh. wonder is what happened between 22 and 60. Oh, nothing. So in other words, if you have 20, you get that same number of points that you get for 40. Oh. Yeah, this, this, this particular um, score, it really what was only really sensitive within this range. Yeah. Uh, just to know why I never I was wondering do we like do we need to think about like privacy and say potential model inversion? So I understand that so for people who are like 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 ethical and who get basically so interpretability would make things transparent, which is great. But in case there's some breach somewhere, like and then say if an adversary gets access to the predictions, is it? Is there often like a risk of then they being able to infer what the individual characteristics were? Okay, this is a wonderful question. And people ask me this very often. They're like, well, now that I know the scoring system, can't I can't I game it? Yeah. Right? Can't I game it? And the answer is, well, the scoring system should be created in a way that it's not possible to game it. So for instance, here, um, the percent of trades never delinquent. You know, frankly, your trades should not be delinquent. Okay, so if you have more trades that are not delinquent, you should be a better, you know, you should be a better, uh, you know, lower risk, right? Um, you know, 
<laughs> I mean, so, so if you, you know, if you, I, I worked for a very long time with a company that wanted to improve their ratings in one of the major rating systems for their products. And so they had me try to reverse engineer the rating system because they were like, we can't figure out what quality means to these guys. I mean, we're producing a product we think is good, but they don't like it. They want a cleaner dashboard. And I was like, yeah, we don't know whether the, you know, we have this much money to spend. How are, how can we improve our product? And the answer is, well, we don't know the scoring system. So we just don't know. And, you know, frankly, if I tell you how to improve your, if I tell you what this credit rating system is, that will help you figure out how to improve your credit, right? You should not be delinquent. Try not to be delinquent, <laughs> right? So, um, so I, I really do think that things like credit risk uh, scoring, these should, these should be um, something that, that uh, people should have um, access to so that they can improve their credit. Yeah. Okay. Does this have, you know, since you're working on survival analysis, can you, uh, there are these Hawks processes that are, I don't know, very useful but hard to fit in uh, statistics. Um, so I'm wondering if you can somehow fit them or bypass them or something. So Hawks processes, if I remember correctly, are things like where you have an earthquake and then you have a a higher chance of an aftershock afterward. And so you can, you add up these, you know, these risks. So, you know, yes, plus on processes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure if that's at all relevant to this, but um, maybe it is, and maybe I just don't see it. Yeah, I don't know either, I was just asking. Yeah, I've, I've used the Hux processes for, for, for the manhole prediction stuff. But, but did you? Yeah, but not for, not for, yeah. Okay. So the last thing I really want to do is um, talk about the decision tree um, algorithm applied to the same data set. So now I want to construct a single decision tree that predicts well on this data set. And I'm going to use the ghost algorithm that I told you, I told you how I told you exactly how it worked. And I want to show you the tree, a tree that ghost produced on this data set. So again, the data set is 10,000 data points over 1,900 binary features. Here we place a depth limit of five um, to just to keep our computation lower. And um, what we got was a tree with only 10 leaves. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Um, this tree has training accuracy 72%. The best black box is 73. Test accuracy is very close to the training accuracy, so it generalized very well. And this tree was produced in 8.1 seconds. So it was produced very, very quickly. And you can go in and look at what it's doing. So it split on external risk estimate, and it's right in that sensitive range, right? The external risk estimate is right in that range between 60 and 70 or whatever, 60 and 80. So it split on, um, on that, and it says if the external risk estimate is has a low value, then um, you're likely not to, uh, you have a higher risk, okay? And that, that's true on the other model too. So just to go double check that. So external risk estimate being low valued is a higher risk. And we got the same thing here for our decision tree, that it's a higher risk if you, if you have a low value of this thing, okay? Then if you have a higher value of it, then we have to split on it again. So if it's a much higher value, then predict that you'll repay your loan. Okay, otherwise, in other words, if you're between 67.5 and 76.5, then we look at sort of more subtle things like your percent of trades that you have with a balance and then the average months that you've been in file and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the, the power of sort of the, of what, of the algorithms that, that I've showed you. Um, and, as I mentioned, um, the two helps to be score is a uh, GAM that is used in a very high stakes um, decision making setting. So um, this one, as I said, this is a scoring system. So all the all the GAM um, coefficients are integers, which is much harder to do computationally. But if you can do it, um, then um, and you can have the GAM create all the thresholds for you and so on then you can create models that are used in these very, very high stakes decision-making settings like intensive care units where people need to be able to memorize the model. Okay, so this is my very last slide. And I just wanna go over what I've taught you. 
So I went over the basics of supervised classification. I also um, taught you the principle of Occam's razor, which is to use the simplest model that fits the data well. And that'll get you between underfitting and overfitting. Um, and so that you have this sweet spot where you can generalize between training and test. I also taught you about regularization where you wanna balance between accuracy and, and sparsity to try to hit that sweet spot. Okay. I taught you decision tree learning, including greedy splitting and pruning and fully optimized trees with the ghost algorithm. I taught you a little bit of information theory when we did the splitting criteria for trees. I also um, spent a long time yesterday on evaluation metrics. And in particular, I taught you confusion matrices and then all of the different statistics you can compute from confusion, confusion matrices, including the true positive rate, false positive rate, and so on. And then the balance between these two constitutes the RSC curve. And then I taught you the AUC, which is the area under that curve that is um, one of probably the most performant, most commonly used performance metric in machine learning. I taught you the exponential loss and its probabilistic interpretation. I also taught you generalized additive models and got you up to the present day on sparse generalized additive models. Um, and then I hopefully have conveyed to you that the, these simple uh, models that I talked to you about are probably, they're probably more powerful than you originally expected. Um, so I don't know how many of you thought that that FICO data set could be handled by a tree that was only 10 leaves or a gown that could fit on a slide, but um, I, I sort of wanted to convey that to you um, so that you understood that you shouldn't underestimate simple models. Okay, thank you very much. It's just so your use of sparsity is what prevent is what results in the model that isn't overfit. Is that right? I do I do think that the sparsity is what's preventing the overfitting. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So at one point you said that the decision trees that are constructed are not necessarily the unique decision tree that you could construct. So um, are you? Are you investigating kind of how to inform people about more than one possible decision tree so they can pick the one that's? Yes, we have. Yes, we have a multiple research projects on exactly that topic. And in fact, we think we can construct the entire set of slightly suboptimal trees. And we're trying to figure out we're, we're working with um, human computer interaction people to try to figure out ways that people can actually explore that space of trees. So this is an active area of research. Um, in my lab. Yeah. Um, regarding the fast sparse algorithm today, can you talk a little bit more about how the priority queue works? Yes. Okay. So if you try to put in an HJ, and then when you when you put it in, you've managed to prove using that analytical formula that you can't that its coefficient goes to zero, then you put it at the back of the queue. <laughs> because like, that feature is probably not that great. Um, and then if you have a feature that um, you do end up putting it in the queue, then that feature, um, um, or if you do end up putting it in the model, that guy stays sort of toward the beginning of the queue so that you end up fiddling around with its coefficient more often. Does that make sense? And then if you have, if you have a coefficient that's in the model and you've tried to investigate whether you could throw it out and you can't, that also goes. Yeah. So it's it's the coefficients, it's the, the coefficients that get that get fiddled with that, that can be going on and off. That those are the ones you're not sure about. And you keep those towards the beginning of the queue. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. <laughs>